Amen. All right. In our last presentation, we were we was finishing off Matthew 24, and I know we didn't really mention much of um, Mark 13, where the the counter the complement or the counterpart to Matthew and Luke 21. Another one we only briefly mentioned it and mentioned those other chap books and chapters in reference to Matthew 24, but they all go together and. and they all wrote in their own unique way to help us understand the signs that Christ gave them to look for. Remember, in, in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, Christ didn't give them dates. He gave them events. He, he, in other words, he's training his disciples, which is us, to read the events that are transpiring in the years they, they transpire. Amen? We're not watching for time. We're watching for the events that Christ listed for us to look for. And when we see these natural events transpire, what do they, as students of prophecy, what do they transfer over now to? Spiritual, right? He gave them natural things to look for. Why did he give them natural things to look for? Uh, Y'all might not get the, the, the answer. That's what appeals, yes, that's true. That's what appeals to the senses. But in relation to his second coming, why did he give them a natural sign to look for to parallel with his second coming? All will see it. Amen. It points to the spiritual. That's because his coming is also what? Because he naturally did what? Came October 22nd. He came to the mold, to the ancient of days to begin the day of It was a natural date that was given to the millwrights that on October 22nd, 1844, Christ was going to literally move from the holy place to the most holy. It was a natural move. So in order to prepare people for this natural move so that they don't leave heaven, they would follow the signs that are transpiring that their eyes can naturally see and move with Christ into the most holy place. Once they get there, those signs that they naturally see now transfer to a spiritual understanding to prepare people for his spiritual people that he's coming to recover at the second coming. Amen? Christ is coming for spiritual worshipers at the second coming. So once we move with him into the most holy place, that means the people who move with him now understand those natural signs point to something else in relation to his kingdom. And if we are not, we don't follow him by faith, we won't understand what those things mean. Y- y'all are following? Amen. So the natural things is for everybody. The natural signs is for the wheat and the tears. That's what I want us to see. But when Christ sets up his kingdom, no tears come in that kingdom, only wheat. And the wheat is spiritual-minded people that can read spiritual things. Amen? That's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The, natu- the spiritual things is not for the natural man. It's for the spiritual worshipers. That's what he tells us. Y'all are following? Amen. So, one, so, after, so the first natural signs was designed literally to take us to October 22nd, 1844. And after this date, all these signs now become spiritual but it should not be hard for the people who um who move with christ on this date to recognize these signs are now pointing to spiritual things it shouldn't be hard from this point forward amen Amen. and that's what makes us what seventh day adventists we're to be spiritual minded people we're not looking at these literal things because satan is going to use the literal darkening of the sun he can now use it why because christ christ must first use the natural and then satan is going to counterfeit he can't counterfeit what christ hasn't done yet y'all follow before he can counterfeit he must see christ do it y'all are following so now that he's seen how christ did it guess what he's going to do counterfeit it we are going to see another dark day we are going to see stars fall from heaven we're going to see these things naturally and these things people are going to take these things that happened in the past and apply it to those things that are happening why just because they can see it just because they can literally see it and it's going to be attached to it some false prophecy that's going to lead their minds in the wrong direction amen yes amen that's what they will end up doing amen amen Amen. Yet, yeah, y'all are following? Mm-hmm. But God's people is going to preserve the memorials that Christ has already set up. Amen? They can't, that's why it's important to understand where the dark day was. It's in the 1260. We have to see it like that. Amen? Mm-hmm. It's very important. That way we have a reference point. We, it's right there, and it can't be moved. The 1260 secures that, that, that dark day. It, all of these things is going to become important. But now let's go into our notes. 
I pray that I can get through this one because I believe this one is very important for us um, here. And I want to highlight that 1888 is a sign that Seventh-day Adventists should have recognized. And what is a sign? It's a, it's a monument. It's a memorial that's intended to keep something in memory. So God wants to keep this date in Seventh-day Adventist memory, and I hope as we go through this, we will see why that is so. And I praise God for this reason. Adventists worldwide, they always point to this date. Why? The only one reason they point to this date. Why? No, not the Sunday law. They don't say nothing about the Sunday law. So by what? The righteous is by, righteous is by faith. I'm not saying the majority of them don't say much about 1888 Sunday law. Yeah, they don't even know. The majority don't. But the majority knows about what? Righteousness by faith. That's all they ever talk about. That's connected to 1888. Yes. And praise God for keeping it in their mind. And I hopefully as we connect this part to it, we would all see why the Lord made sure that they kept 1888 in their mind. It's very important for Adventists to recognize. And that, so let us go through these. I hope we can get down to the end. I'm not going to mention everything because a lot of this was mentioned in Matthew 24. Uh, um, I sent it? I sent it, right? Okay, praise God. Okay. Everyone has it? Can y'all, what, what do y'all see? All right, all right, then we're on the same page. All right, praise God. So it says, Matthew 23 says, um, I'm not going, because we went over this in Matthew 20. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And then Jesus, I love how Luke puts this. He says, Master, but when shall these things be, and what sign will there be when, though, when these things shall come to pass? I love how Luke phrases it. So Christ told them the house is left unto them desolate. They asked the question, um, what shall be the sign of the destruction of Jerusalem? And what shall be the sign of his second coming? And Christ gave them a list of natural things to take place. So we take these natural things, we put them, natural things is the natural fulfillment of prophecy. So we take these natural fulfillment of prophecy and now we're looking for their spiritual application, which can be applied anywhere throughout time. And God is going to raise up people to recognize, just like he rose up people to recognize the natural fulfillment. He will also raise up people to recognize the spiritual fulfillment. But those who are carnally minded won't recognize the spiritual fulfillment. They'll only want to stick to the natural fulfillment. Y'all follow? All right. So let's continue. Here's what Christ says. When you therefore shall not see, shall see. All right. So and then go down to the next one. He says, then let them be in Judea flee. When you see the, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in a holy place, Christ says, flee, right? Luke says, and when ye shall see Jerusalem come past with what? Armies. Go down to the next. Then let them which, be, which are in Judea, what? Flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it, what? Depart out. So go to Mark 13. It says, but when you shall, what? See the abomination of desolation spoken, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. What? L look how he puts it. It's very important how Mark writes it. He doesn't write it like Matthew and, and Luke. He writes it standing where it ought not. So when you see this thing where it shouldn't be, it's time to what? Flee. It's very important that he says it this way. So when you recognize that, wait a minute, this is in a place that it should not be in. This is the sign. Let's get out of Jerusalem. Amen? Amen. And let us, and then Christ tells them to go to, to Pelia. And we're going to look at that next. So here's what Ellen White has to say in GC. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be what? Keep that phrase locked up in your memory. We're going to build up on that one later on. Should be set up in the holy ground, which extends some furlongs outside the city walls. Then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the warning sign what? Should be seen. What's another way I can say seen? There's another way. Visible. What's another one? Under, yes, amen. Understood. I like that one. It's visible. It's understood. There's an, give me another one. Huh? Yes, it's a sign. How about, can we use recognize? All right, that's the one I was looking for. So, but those three, those two, I like them. Visible, understood, and recognize. So let's put that in here. When the warning sign should be recognized, when the warning sign should be visible, when the warning sign should be understood. Y'all following? Because Christ says, who so read it, let him what? Understand. understand. So all of these can go right there. That's what it's saying. 
So when it should be seen, visible, understood, those who would escape must make no delay throughout the land of Judea as well as in Jerusalem itself. The signal for flight must be immediately what? It must be what? Immediately. This is talking about us. Keep that in mind. We're seeing this. It's visible to us, and we're recognizing it. So keep these things in mind. All right, let's look at the next one. Uh, there's a lot I could have said about the Roman banner, but I wouldn't have time to go into it. It's, it's really a nice thought. I'll just add this. The Roman banner was, a, was an insignia of their religion. That's what it was. So when, just go look up history. They would carry their banner, that, meaning they had their representation of their God on their flag. And the legion would go out with that God protecting them in battle. That's So when they put that flag there, our religion just conquered you. And when you see the army, our nation just defeated you. So your nation is under the power of our God, and your nation is under the power of our state. That's what the Roman banner meant, and the Roman army. That's why Matthew says abomination, Luke says army. The religion and the state conquered Jerusalem. Y'all follow? Amen, amen, yes. The, 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 every nation ascribed their power to their God, to their ideology, to their teaching. And, and it was not on, the Romans put their idea and their God on their Roman banner, their insignia. Y'all follow? Amen. Keep these things in mind. I, I said I wasn't going to go into it, but yeah, yes, amen, the black flag, amen. So flags are very important. Our banner is the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel, That's our, which is the Sabbath. So it says, not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Christ had given his disciples warning, and all who what? Believed his words did what? Watch for the promised sign. So if we believe, we're going to watch. Amen? If we don't believe, that means we're not watching, and that's why we're not preparing. That's why we're not making the necessary changes in our lives that we should make. If we believe these things, that Christ said them, and they happen, changes should be seen in our lives. Amen? So going on, it says, after the next bowl, after the Romans under Cestius had surrounded the city, they unexpectedly abandoned the siege when everything seemed favorable for an immediate attack. Next one. I'm going on. It says, but God's merciful providence was directing events for the good of his own people. The promised sign had been given to the waiting Christians, and now an opportunity was offered to all who would to obey the Savior's warning. Events were so what? So when this sign comes, there's a what? Overruling of events. Who's God overruling? Who's he overruling? Satan. That means Satan wants to bring something, but God is overruling it for his people to forgive them time to recognize the sign. Y'all are following? Keep that in mind. This is, these things are very important for us. Overrule that neither Jews nor Romans should hinder the flight of the Christians. Upon the retreat of Cestius, the Jews sallying from Jerusalem pursued after his return in army, retreat in army, ret retire in army, and while both forces were thus fully engaged, the Christian had an opportunity to leave. Jump down to the next bolt. I love this part. Without delay, they fled to a place of safety, the city of what? So they left a large city for a what? Small. All right. Give me a large city once again. Just three this time. New York, Chicago, Tokyo. NYC, Tokyo, Stella, To, K, Y, O, right? And Chi Town. I'm going to just put Chi. Chi Town, right? Yes, it's Genesis 19. Amen. So go ahead. Amen. Yes, but did he do it? Yes. Amen. Amen. Eventually, they're going to have to do what? Flee to the mountain. Eventually, they're going to have to go. Amen. Amen. And I'm, I'm going to add this part. They flee to the mountains when Titus comes back. When Titus comes back, they're going to the mountains. But those who see this, if you're a faithful Abraham, you go straight to the mountain. Amen. Lot delays and go to the smaller city. Y'all are following? Mm -hmm. That's what Genesis 19, t Lot lingered. It's lingering ones that really go to the smaller city. But in mercy to us, God permits us to go to the smaller city for a time. Amen? Amen. All right. So that's what Genesis 19 does when you can. Oh, I forgot this. Consistency. Large city, 
then go to a small city. Amen? Ju Jerusalem to Pella. So they went from city to city. That's why I love the spirit of prophecy. He's just so consistent. Abraham also went from her to her Amen. Yes, he did. Amen. And then his father died, yeah. and then he went, then yeah, he went out. It says, consistency is a what? Jewel. Jewel. The testimonies themselves will be the key that will what? Explain the messages given as scripture is explained by what? You know why I love this quote? What is it saying in simplest terms? No, that's not what it's. Yes, it's saying that. Praise God. The same way we study the Bible is the same way we study the testimonies. What does that mean? We don't build a house on one verse. So don't build a house on one quote. Y'all are following? Take, if you want to understand what she means by a certain phrase, trace that phrase through her writings and see how she used that phrase. If every Adventist follow this rule, this will aid you to study your Bible. Why? Because she's writing in language suitable for our day. Yeah. So when we just study her writing, that's why it's so easy. That's what we did in the beginning when we came into this movement, isn't it? Yeah. We took her writings and we traced, she said it over here. She said it this way over here. And what we do, we bring them together. And if, how does Miller's rule say if you can form your fury without a contradiction, then you can, amen, pray, praise God, students of prophecy. Amen. You cannot what? You cannot be in error, and you have the truth. Amen. So the way we study the Bible is how we, and I want to encourage people, study the testimonies that way. When she writes one thing and you see a phrase, trace that phrase through her writers and see how she uses it in these different, and then form that theory. Amen. So let us go on. So this is what we're going to do as we go forward. Oh, okay, amen. Makes it particle. That's nice, amen. That's a nice example. Amen, that's a very nice example. So going on, time and place, right? Not going to read this. She says, in regards to the testimonies, time and place must be considered, amen? Meaning, you must recognize the time she's in and the place in why she's saying that testimony. We follow? That rule applies to what? The Bible. She can't use it if it's not applied to the Bible. So, Amen. Amen. Many theologians only take this rule and that's it. They study their Bible. We got to understand Paul in his grammatical historical setting. And that's how they do it. But that's just one method. You follow? Because whatever Paul was saying applies to all time. It doesn't matter. So when we see the, the conditions that meet the circumstance that Paul was in, this perfectly fits the case. Amen. It may not manifest itself the same way, but it fits the case. Like she says, bicycles, we shouldn't buy bicycles. What was the time she was saying that in? Bicycles was Benz, right? Yeah, yeah. It was expensive. It was expensive. Amen. Can I use that quote today? No. That's stupid, isn't it? Because you can get a bicycle for $5. You can get it for $10. You can get it for free. Amen. Yes, you can. So back then, they were, it was a craze. Rich people were the only one that could really buy it. Yeah. And, and people were saving up all ridiculous amounts of money to buy a bicycle. And, she, and God rebuked it for that time. Now take that and transfer it. And today is a Benz. It's a BMW. It's a Ferrari. Whatever it is. A, a Lexus. No Christian is really riding around in those things. Because it gives a bad representation to the message you bear. Amen. Christ rode on a what? An ass, a common vehicle. That's what Christ rode on. Y'all follow? An ass was a common thing. And when a king rode on it, it was showing his humility that he was one of the people. Y'all follow? Kings, rich kings ride on what? Horses, well-trained vehicles. That's what they ride. But Christ came on a lowly and riding on an ass. So a lowly person will buy a Honda and a, and a Ford and, 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 and a Hyundai and those things. That's what a lowly, do y'all follow? Mm -hmm. You just transfer the symbol to a, v, a, a donkey was a mode of transportation. So that's why I can take that and, tra and bring it down to my time. So a minister, for his mode of transportation, he will choose a lowly vehicle. A vehicle that will not exalt him, but actually make him a little humble. Amen? Amen. You see how I just transfer that? That's how you start. You bring the principle down to your time. That's all we do. Okay. Changed it. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Amen. It was changing the standard of dressing. All right, going on. 
So time and place, right? So here's what she says. The time is not what? Far, Far distant. Yeah. When, jump down, when like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a re refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christian, Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation and the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath, what? Will, will be a warning to, is it still, is it now or is it future? future? It's future. So from her time, she's pointing forward, right? So she says, it will then be what? Time, time to leave the large cities preparatory to leave in the smaller ones. When did she write this? I have it right there, right? So the time for this quote is 1885. And she says the time from 1885 is not far distance when we, Ellen White, Joseph Bates, Uriah Smith, when we shall have to, like the disciples, flee the large cities. Y'all see this? We have to put her in her time. That's why I'm saying this. It was present truth for them. All right, so now let's go forward. Let's go for it. Let's see why God gave this warning. Let's look at why the Lord gave this warning. Without delay, they fled to a place of safety, the city of Pella, Assumption of Power. The first Sunday law bill was proposed on May 21st, 1888 by Senator Blair. Y'all following? I need a reader. I need someone that can read well because the next slide is going to be a little difficult for me, but it fits what I, what I was putting in. So I need someone that reads well and loud. Um, can somebody come up um, for this next slide, please? Read for me very loudly. And we want to look at Senator Blair's bill. We want to look at what Senator Blair actually said. Um, it's coming up. <laughs> All right, so the next one I'm going to need a reader. Swinney, you going to do it? Yeah. Okay, praise God. The people need to be aroused in regard to the dangers of the what? The time. What time is she writing in? I, I, I wrote it down there. 1888. Remember, time and place must be considered when reading the testimonies. Amen? So she says, per peril it. perils now threatening the people of God, and what will they do? Can we not assist in lifting the standard and in calling to the front those who have a regard for their religious rights and privileges? God calls us to what? So when we see the sign, what does it do? It should awaken us to awake, for the end is what? What, when they saw Cestius, what was it? The end. the end is near. Okay, all right, so let's keep it on. The prophecies that show us the closing scenes of Earth's history are what? Fast fulfilling. We have been looking many years for a Sunday law to be enacted in our land. And what? Now. And now that the movement is right upon us, we ask, what are our people going to do in the matter? When did she write this? All right, soon. Read. Amen. Can you read this next one? I got to stand next to you for the mic. You come up here because I, I wanted to make sure I get in there so that they hear it. All right. The United States almost had a national Sunday law. One was proposed in the U.S. Senate on May 21st, 1888. This was what was proposed. The bill proposed by Senator Blair and upon which the argument was made is as follows. In the Senate of the United States, May 21st, 1888, Mr. Blair introduced the following bill, which was read twice and referred to the Committee on Education and Labor. What did they connect it to? Education. So what does Satan want to destroy at the end of the world connected with the Sunday law? Education. And what do we see happening in America right now? A battle over what? Education. So what should be connected with this battle? Education. No, a Sunday law. So what should the next sign be that we see? Something about a Sunday law. Y'all are following? It's not a coincidence that in 1888 they tied it to education. Satan is doing the same thing at the end of the world. Public, we should not have our children in public schools. This is a clear testimony taught to us. Public school is dangerous for our children. In fact, she goes higher. She says colleges are even worse for our children. We're not to send our school to the higher education because it's the mystery of iniquity. All they teach you is papal 
doctrine. She teaches us, they prepare us to receive the mark of the beast. That's what education is designed for, to make us receive Sunday as the day of worship. That's why Satan connected the two together. Y'all are following? Also not to bring it home. Yeah, we shouldn't, yeah, we shouldn't bring it there. Go ahead. A bill to secure the people the enjoyment of the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day, as a day of rest, and to promote its observance as a day of religious worship. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that no person or corporation or the agent, servant or employee, or any person or corporation shall perform or authorize to be performed any secular work, labor, or business to the disturbance of others, works of necessity, mercy, and humanity expected. Accepted. Accepted. Nor shall any person engage in any play, game, or amusement, or recreation to the disturbance of others. Stop right there. If Satan is adding this to his day, what does that say about God's day? The same thing applies. It can't be an image if it's not mimicking God's day. So amusement, play, recreate, these things are restricted upon the seventh day Sabbath. The same thing. Y'all follow? If Satan is counterfeiting the Sabbath, that means the Sabbath calls for the same thing. Notice what he says, acts of mercy, kindness. What did Jesus say? It's good to do good on the Sabbath. Acts of mercy. This is where Satan, they're just taking the things that belongs to the Sabbath and putting it up on Sunday. That's what they're doing. Y'all are following? Yes. So from this, we can see the truth. We can see the truth about the Sabbath by reading this. Everything that Satan is putting in there, just transfer it to the true day of worship. Y'all are following? Amen. All right, go ahead. It says, game or amusement or recreation to the disturbance of others on the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day, or doing any part thereof in any territory, district, vessel, are placed subject to the exclusive juris jurisdiction of the United States, nor shall it be lawful for any person or corporation to receive pay for labor or service performed or rendered in violation yeah. of this section. Thank you, bro. I'm going to need you for another one later on. Do y'all see that this was a real Sunday law? Mm -hmm. yeah. This was a real Sunday law in 1888. They really, Ellen White says two, three years before it came, where the time is not far distant when our religious liberty is going to be restricted. Three years later, bam, a Sunday law. So if I'm following that prophetic pattern, what are we here doing? What are we here saying? Soon. That what? That what? Soon. Soon. So God confirmed for Seventh-day Adventists that Satan's plan is to bring a Sunday law. So the great sign for Seventh-day Adventists is a common Sunday law. And God gave that sign to Seventh-day Adventists to wipe away all doubt from their mind that a Sunday law really is going to be passed in this nation. Y'all follow? Amen. He gave that sign in 1888. That sign was to let them know that this Satan is really ready to bring the Sunday law. It's God that's overruling him from even doing that. It's ready to go. It's God that's restraining him from doing it. He's ready to bring it. All of his agents are in place to bring it. But God in his infinite wisdom, he sees we're not ready and he's restraining Satan. But I keep saying this, for, for how long God restrains Satan, that's how much we're going to suffer when the Sunday law really comes. The longer he restrains Satan, Satan is get, he's going to be able to bring more suffering upon God's people. Y'all are following? The longer we wait, the more we suffer. The less we wait, the quicker we'll get it over with. Y'all are following? They didn't, they didn't want to go into the land after 11 days, so they went 40 years. And Ellen White says 40 years later, it was now harder to actually take the land. Satan got his people ready, and they were prepared. They, didn't, they never had an army at that time. But because they saw what Israel was doing, the people had time to prepare an army. In this time, America didn't really have an army. They didn't have the world's strongest army. Their army was number 18 in the world by the time of World War II. They, were the, they had the number 18 strongest army in the world in, by the time World War II came. But they had the world's number one what? Economy. They, had the, they built up their economy, and it wasn't until the time of FDR that they built up, that they began to do what? Really build up their military. And by the time you come to 89, they had the world's best economy, 
and the world's best military, and they transferred it all to who? Labor. Rome. They gave Rome the power to use the economy and the military, Daniel 1140. Y'all are following? Yeah. So that was our sign. Oh, man, Satan wants to bring the Sunday law. But God keeps holding his evil eyes upon us to overthrow us. But God knows we're not ready, and he's teaching us the first and second. But let us go to the next. I hope I can get to that. I just really want us to see that they recognized that this was fulfilling prophecy. This is what Senator Blair says. Um, AT jo the church asked A.T. Jones to go defend the, the Sabbath and defend our religious liberty. They, they asked him. And it was God's providence because he gave Jones and Wagner the message specifically for that crisis. Amen. He gave them the right. This is what we now have to do. Righteousness by faith is connected to the Sunday law issue. Adventists must know and understand this. You cannot teach righteousness by faith without teaching that 1888 was a time of the Sunday law. You just can't do it. Amen. That's when he's going to revive it. Amen. The Lord gave them a message that they needed to live in the time of that crisis. Y'all, everyone's following? So I just, that was a sign. There was another thought that um, I won't, it hopefully it'll come back. So here's what Blair said. I might not go through the, all of it. Senator Blair says, do you not think there is a dis distinction between a majority in a monarchical government and a majority in a republicanism government, a Republican government? In a monarchical government, the majority is simply one man who has power. This is 1889. So here's what Jones is going to say in reference to... Um, to what Senator Blair says. But in a republic, when you throw this subject into civil affairs, it makes a great deal of difference. Why, sir? We would object to the passage of a law enforcing the observance of the day which we keep, and to accept an exemption clause would only be to contradict ourselves. Allow me to illustrate it. What Jones is arguing, they were going to give Seventh-day Adventists an exemption clause to keep the Sabbath. But Jones was like, we're not taking that, because to accept the exemption, the exemption clause, we're actually denying the Sabbath. And he, this is what he's going to explain. Because if all I have to be is an Adventist to accept the Sabbath, I'm not going to read the part. Jones says an atheist can say he's an Adventist right. and get an exemption clause so he can open up his liquor store on Sunday. That's the same as the, 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 the gender situation. All you have to do is say that this is what you are. And you get to Amen. The opposite Amen. <laughs> but here's what it does. It restricts you from being anything else. Right. You're forced to be that. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to be that, you can't even be that. So it's con yes, amen, 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 and and Blair saw that and realized, and Jones was like, at some point you're gonna have to force Sunday, mm -hmm. because people are just gonna say, well, I'm gonna be an Adventist, and right. and actually you're gonna add tears to God's church, mm -hmm. you're gonna bring in more tears than you think by saying that there's an exemption. It was, we we saw a thing similar to that with the vaccine yes. exemption. Yes, so amen. Yes, yes. So yes. That amen. Get the vaccine amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. But they, but how do we know if they're genuinely Adventists? Exactly. We don't know. So going on says there was a time when we did not keep the seventh day as a Sabbath. While we did not keep it, we had the right not to keep it. We became convinced that we ought to keep it, and we are now doing so. We have the right to keep it. More than this, we have the right not uh, not right again not to keep it if we choose not to keep it. But if, while keeping it, we should consent to the state's assumption of power to the what? The what did Ellen White say? So the assumption of power will be the what? Sign to do what? Leave the... So the, so the Adventists in 1888 recognized this is the assumption of power. Y'all are following? This is it. Every Adventist should have left the large cities till this day. Not one Adventist should be living in a single large city on planet Earth right now. Not one. This is the sign to Seventh-day Adventists, get out of the large cities now. Not tomorrow. Not yes, right now. Without delay, get out. It's a promise. Don't say to yourself, well, my job and this. No, if God says get out, get out. It's a promise. He will open up the way for you to get out. Mm -hmm. We are a living testimony to that. We left the large city of where? New York. New York City. We just did what? We just got out. We were impressed to leave, and we just left. We didn't understand all of this. We just left on account that God says not to live in the large cities, and we went to a small city. In fulfillment of that, and that only shows me, God, you was really guiding us in our ignorance. You have girded us, though we have not known you. Amen? 
he made sure our lives in ignorance meet the specifications of prophecy. So when we look back, we can see that his powerful hand guided us even in our level of ignorance. Y'all are following? Isn't that what he did for Cyrus? So that's what he does for everybody. Amen? So go ahead. It's very powerful. Yes, it is. Amen. There was a time when we didn't keep the Sabbath. So we could have some other, there was a time when I didn't know I'm washing every week. Right? True. But once I came to know, I didn't do it. And I have every right to go. This is telling you that people have the right to make that choice. When they want. When they yeah. want to. However, the state, they have no right to force the state to partake in that choice. Because this is what they were trying to do. They were trying to the reform movement was trying to force the state to partake in the choice of Sunday. Yes. It's the same principle with the Roman way. In fact, it would be the same principle then with anything they try to force upon you. Amen. And the offer you an exemption. Yeah. 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 Amen. Offer you an exemption. Amen. Exemptions, it's only a denial yeah. of the thing you want to be exempted from. Amen. Amen. So yeah. It's an exemption they're seeking. Amen. It, it, it's not there. Amen. Going on. Because if you take the exemption now, you will do it in the Sunday law. You will take it. It says, but if while keeping it, we should consent to the state's assumption of power to compel us to do that, which we have the right, of, right to omit if we please, we would therein resign our freedom of religious faith and worship. All right. So let, let me see if I want to continue with his next um, point. Uh, you can read the next one on your time in there. Um, do I want to read it? Yeah, you can read that, the remainder of it. Um, but it's really a nice read, and I, I, I encourage us to, to, to take a look at it. So I just want to go now to set up. Go back to, the, to remember, she says, when the idolatrous standards should be set up, this is a warning to us to leave the large cities. And we just read that A.T. Jones went to send, he spoke to Senator Blair personally himself, and he says, Senator Blair, Blair, this assumption of power is only is only forcing us, forcing a day of worship on us. Just go read that whole history about 1888. And, and I forgot to put this up here. 1888 was the time period of Cestius. That's what it was. It was the time period of Cestius. For the first, the Roman standard was set up in our land. This assumption of power on the part of the United States was taking place in that time. Time and place must be considered when reading the testimonies. Amen? So now let's look at what she says in regards to this setup. Uh, sorry, I went, went away too fast. Here we go. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the one in sign should be recognized, visibly seen, understood, we leave. Amen? So when 1888 is recognized, seen, understood, we need to go. We've missed the sign long ago. Amen? We've missed it. Adventists missed it long ago, but it's still in force today. It's still in force because the next time the issue comes back up, it's not going anywhere. And if you're in a large city when it comes back up, man, that's unfortunate for you. Y'all follow? If, if the people didn't know, God will have mercy upon them. Cestius, Cestius and Titus is teaching us mercy and judgment. That's what they're teaching us. Judgment and mercy is going to be mingled in the Sunday Law Crisis. It's not that we won't have a Cestius time period again. That's mercy for one who didn't know. But Titus is for, for those who what? did know and judgment is going to fall upon them because they knew and some people they had the opportunity to know but they chose what not to know because we're going to be punished for both if we had the opportunity to know and we didn't take out make advantage of it then we're going to be judged Ellen White says we'll be judged as if we did know and and, and rejected it yes they should have and fled amen that's exactly what was supposed to happen Australia so in the same time, 1897, here's what was happening in Australia. Earnest movements have been made here in the parliaments to have God acknowledge in the government of this nation. 
Earnest efforts have been made to prevent this, knowing that it meant, no, it meant nothing less than religious bigotry and oppression. When religion is mixed with civil government, it means much to who? Seventh-day Adventists. A union of church and state means a recognition of a spurious Sabbath. Amen? So when we see this, it means much to us. That's what 1888 was. It meant much to us. This movement demanded that all observe as sacred and idle Sabbath resembles the act of Nebuchadnezzar in making a golden image and what? Setting it up for all to what? When did she say this? What did she say was set up? The image. Yes, it was set up for all to worship. Well, what does set up mean? We're going to look at that later. It says the Sunday idol is, is what? Set up. As She didn't say going to be. She said it is set up. The Roman standard is set up. This nation is ready to bring a what? A Sunday law. It's ready. This was just God giving Adventists the plans of Satan. He's ready to bring the Sunday law crisis. And, if it, and God overruled him in that time so that he doesn't bring it. So wait a minute, if God overruled him, it's still waiting for him to bring. Mm -hmm. It's still waiting for Satan, is waiting for the opportunity to, for God to say, go ahead and bring it. That's all he's waiting on, to go ahead from God. Human laws demand that it, it be worshipped as sacred and holy, thus putting it where God's holy Sabbath should be. 1897. Go ahead. Yes, I amen. Have, yes, amen. I saw that too. He's far. Can you read this? Great Babylon that I have built. Amen. That's him planting his standard where God's standard is. So, what did Senator Blair say? Uh, is this not Great Babylon yes. that we have and built? God amen. For his purposes. Amen. This is the part that I needed to read it on because it's a little bright for me, but I like the background. Oh, you didn't, you didn't read to it? Get it on the mic, though. That's cool. I know he's monitoring me. Oh, you don't need to. You feel that? Yeah. We feel deeply over the present state of the church whose members have long possessed a knowledge of those events which are to transpire near the close of time in the fulfillment of prophetic history. Amen. Amen. She's speaking for her time. Amen. So let us continue with, with, with this statement. Let us look at how well she uses this. Um, she says, the faith, and, the faith and patience of those who, who have waited long have been sorely tried. Hope deferred has made the heart sick, and the cry has come up before God, Lord, how long? But now, but what? But now the signs are fulfilling. Listen to these. Very, this is important. Listen to this. Nation rising against nation, startling calamities by land and by sea. Famine, pestilence, fearful storms, sweeping floods, and great conflagrations. What's the next word? Awesome. What makes this important? Has there been floods before? Yes. Has there been earthquakes before? Yes. Has there been fires before? Yes. What does Matthew say, though? These, these, are, these are tied to the abomination of desolation. Yes, they, praise God. It says that, but I want us to see something. Christ says when you see all these at the same time. Not earthquake in five years ago and flood 10 years, this and 15 years apart. No, when you see them all transpiring, convulging at the same time, it's not natural. Y'all follow? It's not natural to have an earthquake, then a flood, then a fire, then a tornado, then this, then riots, then pestilence, then a storm in the Capitol Hill. And then this, and now you're having a famine in the world, and now you have, you have um, ministers being thrown out of their government. You have this taking place. You have the threat of a war. You have Russia invading Ukraine. All these things are happening at the same time. Y'all follow? Not five years apart, not two years apart, not three years apart, in the same year. Yes. Amen. Amen. So the next thing we shall see, let's see what Ellen White says. This was their time. So in order for God to repeat it, he must make the same things transpire again. He's bringing us over the same ground again. And Christ says, all these things 
are the beginning of what? Sorrows. And now Christ, like Swinon said, is going to connect the abomination to all these things. So let us continue. All these testify that we are approaching the grand consummation. The cry going up to God from the waiting ones will not be in vain. The response will come. It is done. Let us go on. Let's go to this next one. Continue on. Continue with the same, this same quote, um, same um, article. It says the crisis is what now, now upon us. The battle, <clears throat> the battle is to be waged between the Christianity of the Bible and the Christianity of the of human tradition. Is there not a criminal neglect in our present sleepy condition? This is true. This is talking about us. This is a criminal neglect. We're seeing these things, and yet they don't mean anything to us. They're not moving us. When Christ says all these things, this is showing us that we will be in the Sunday law crisis and probably won't even recognize that we're even in it. That's how bad we are. We are so bad that all these things is happening. It's not urging us. It's not moving us. It's not making us to go study our Bibles to see what we need to prepare for what is coming. At the Sunday law, we can't prepare for the Sunday law. And if we're not prepared for the Sunday, I'm telling you, we're going to go through this with Daniel 11:40. If we are not prepared for the Sunday law, you will be lost immediately as soon as it begins. As soon as it begins, if you're not ready, you will be lost. We cannot come to the Sunday law and prepare for the Sunday law. It's impossible. We have to be prepared. Adventists are in advance of everybody else. We are to be ad ready, advanced. We should be ready in advance for the crisis. The world is going to be a surprise for them, but it's okay. God is going to have mercy upon them because they didn't know, like we know. But for Adventists, it's completely different. We're judged differently when that test comes. Well, listen to what she says. We must, show, we must show to the what? The world that we what? Recognize. Recognize in the events that are what? Now taking place in connection with the what? National reform movement, the fulfillment of what? So COVID-19, these earthquakes, these famines, these prime ministers going out, what is going to be connected with it now? A reform movement. Do y'all recognize a call for movement by these churches? Yep. It's getting stronger by the day. And it's not very far before they connect Sunday to this reform. Mm -hmm. I believe that's literally what we're about to see yep. soon. And when we see it, no idleness. We got a battle. It's time to battle. We're going to, just like Adventists had to go up to the Senate, guess what we're going to have to do? We're, because we're called now. By them passing a the bill, we are now called. We're forced to speak. Y'all follow? Amen. We're forced to speak up on this issue. And this is what's going to show whether we're prepared or unprepared. It says, that which we have for the last 30 or 40 years proclaimed what would come is now what? Here. Here. That's present truth for them. It was now there. Now let us continue with this next one. And she continues with, with the thought. When it became known, I'm taking this principle, 1840, Josiah Lich predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire, and it fell in 1840. And when you read GC, Ellen White says, when this became known by people after it long happened, what did she say happened? People repented. When it became known that it was predicted that Ottoman Empire would fall in 1840, people, multitudes responded by repenting. So whenever prophecy becomes known to us, even though it happened 15 years later, once it becomes known, we repent. How do I know that's true? Because 31 AD is still relevant. When it becomes known to us that Christ died for our sin, wherever we are in the history of the world, we need to repent. Whenever we understand what happened at 31 AD, we repent. It's still a sign to turn away from sin. Amen? So in 1888 is recognized by Seventh-day Adventists that this was a fulfillment of prophecy that Cestius surrounded Jerusalem. The Roman banner was set up in our land. It was standing where it ought not in Congress. When we see that and comprehend it and understand it, the reaction should be get out of the large cities. Amen. Yes, confess the sin. But no, you got to leave now, right? Once you see this, once you acknowledge 1888 is a fulfillment of prophecy, Get out of the large cities. 
drop whatever you're doing. It doesn't matter how, how many years you got left to retire. It doesn't matter how long you've been working there. It doesn't matter how long you had your house there. It doesn't matter that your house was passed down from your mother and your, your uncle and so forth and so forth. Leave it, sell it, and get out immediately right now. Amen? Amen. That's the sign. That's what that means. That's how we show we believe that we're fulfilling Bible prophecy. Amen. If we don't do it, we're not showing that. And if we're not showing that, then when Titus comes back, it's going to be you that get destroyed in that city. Because uh, why this has to be understood is very specific who Satan gets to destroy. He what God is not going to allow him to touch the ignorant man. He's only going to allow him to touch those who know. How do I know that? Because that's what Ezekiel 9 teaches me. That the destroying angels was commanded only hurt those that have that's not sighing and crying. Only them. Begin at my house. Begin at, yes. But could they touch the rest of the people? No. no. So Satan has specific command, don't touch these people, but you have all right to touch all those people who refuse to obey the sign that I sent them. Amen? Yes, amen. So go to this next one. This battle between Christ and Satan is a real fight. It's a real fight. Real things are at stake in this fight. And I thank God that Christ is the commander of this fight. And, and Ellen White says the Holy Spirit is the overseer that everything happens the way Christ says it should happen. He says, I will send my comforter, and he's going to do all the things that Christ tells him. So the Holy Spirit is directing all the movements on this planet. He's directing Satan to do his part. He's directing God's people to do their part. And Christ is issuing the command of what to be done by him and Satan. Y'all follow? Christ is directing the whole move. Satan has his idea to bring the evil, but Christ says when, and Christ says no, and Christ says yes. That's, that's the role that we have to understand these things. Otherwise, we will be scared when, when things get real. We're going to really be scared if we don't see that Christ is directing these things. Cestius is designed to impress upon our minds that God is in control of everything. Go ahead. Nine minutes? Thank you, Sasha. It says, already we are beginning to hear the voice of the dragon. There is a satanic force, what? Propelling the Sunday movement. But it is what? What is it? Concealed. What did she say? It's what? Hidden. It's hidden. There's a satanic force that was propelling 1888, mm -hmm. but it's concealed. So that means what Satan really wants to bring, he's not letting people know. Not even the ones bringing it. But praise God, Christ is going to tell us exactly what he's going to bring. When we get to the next point in our experience, man, those scriptures is going to open up the judgments that are going to come. God is going to show us the desire that Satan hopes to bring upon people. But we're not going to see it if we're in the large cities. We're not going to see it. Some may not discern those. They're not, because you didn't even discern the sign. Yeah. So how are you going to see what? If you can't see that this was fulfilling prophecy, how are you going to believe anything Christ shows you? If you don't respond to this, you can't believe anything else. So going to propel, and it means driving forward. Um, and I have this in there. This is the train that the world will get on. This propelling force of Satan. Y'all know that prophecy in early writings? She saw a train going with lightning speed. And who was the conductor? Satan. Satan. He was driving it forward, propelling it forward. It was the Sunday law movement. Amen. So we're coming down to this um, spirit working of spiritualism. Um, set up. Here's what set up means when you look it up in the 1828 Webster. To put forward something such as a plan for what? What was Senator Blair putting forward? A plan. a plan for what? Acceptance. That's what it means to set up. Whenever we see them put forward a plan to be accepted, they've set it up. Y'all follow? It doesn't mean that it's there. No, they set it up. They're setting up that this is the plan that everyone must accept in going forward. This is the plan that the nation is going to, that's what they mean when they say it's set up. Next one. To put the machine in readiness or adjustment for an operation. And this is what Senator Blair was bringing to the people. Um, and just this part now, AMS. The aim and purpose of the National Reform Combination was precisely the aim, the purpose, and the intense desire of the Church of Rome. Therefore, all these years, Rome watched with interested attention the National Reform Movement and waited for that movement to grow to such a state as, to, as would be to her advantage to cooperate with. And it was not unadvisably that in 1889, the Catholic Church joined hands with the National Reform Combination 
to bring the Protestant masses over to the reverent observance of the Catholic Sunday. And it was with great gladness that she heard the supreme judicial declaration that this is a Christian nation with the, with the citation of Catholic documents to prove it. And also saw Congress, what? Yeah. Set up the sign of her own authority, the Sunday as the holy day of nation, uh, as the holy day of the nation in express exclusion of the Sabbath of the Lord. It was with supreme satisfaction that she saw her own sign of her own salvation set up here by a national act as the symbol of the salvation of the nation. Doing this makes Satan happy. Amen. But Jesus says, I do always those things that please you. Keeping Sunday pleases Satan. Keeping the Sabbath pleases God. So those who are in an advent of this are Satan loves them. So it's not Rome that we should be seeing that's delighting in this. Satan is rejoicing that he's getting to go forward. He's rejoicing that God has given him permission to bring about this national act. But praise God for the destruction of Jerusalem. That first setting up was only Cestius preparing to strike. Y'all follow? 1888 was just God giving us the advance warning that Satan is not only preparing to strike, he's ready to strike. He's ready. He's just waiting for God to say, go. That's all he's waiting on. He's just waiting for Christ to say, go, bring it. But praise God, 1989 came to give us another clear indication that Satan is ready to bring it. But praise God for Islam at 9-11, God said, overruled, no, not now. Why? Because we here are not ready. So Christ, praise God, he brought us time. But remember, judgments deferred means worse a situation when the time does come. Every time God defers our judgment, all he's doing, the evil that should have came in 2001, 2002, 2003, he's holding it back and he says, okay, I'm going to make it come in 2024. I'm going to make it come in 2025. So all those evils that should have came then, it now comes. That's why it can now become all these things. Y'all follow? All these things is just what should have came Broken over time, God just make them come. I praise God for this understanding Amen. because he's showing us how he does this. That's what he's doing. That's why all these things happen because it's telling us those are all the judgments that God bottled up. That should have came in the days of our fathers. But in mercy to us, he delayed them. But in the days of the fourth generation, he's pouring them out in measure, in measure. But when he fully pours them out, man, just imagine all the evils that we're going to see at one time, at one time. And unfortunately for those, it's going, to be, it's going to be next to impossible to find faith in that time if we don't have it before that time. Amen. Go ahead, Swindon. I was going to say, and this is only starting with one of the first things I was having, because it says in the Cestius, and then you put, let me quote what you said, Cestius left, and then they fled after Cestius. Yes, so I want to say Me too. Me too. I was going but, to say. But I think the Lord is bringing it up. This is why I want to have. One of the things you just raised up is, is how did the Jews feel when they chased after Cestius? Like they were victorious. Okay, that's yeah. not the ruling queen. Ah, it praise God. Amen. It, it was yes, money, that's nice. Money, amen. America feels strong. Yeah. After the world. Yes, amen. So that's nice. Says, that's no nice. Real estate. Amen. No stops. That's nice. No one that's nice. She was trying to keep them from fleeing after Cestius. Amen. So come to 9-11. What are we living in now? Stocks. Real estate. And and but what's happening to them? That. They're yeah. going down. All Adventists are yeah. still going into that stuff. They're repeating the sins of the world. Amen. They're chasing after Cestius. Right Praise now. God. Praise God. I, 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 I believe that because I believe the Lord is leading this movement. Yeah. I I know he's leading this little movement that, that we are following. I pray that we all can come to a place where we have that individual testimony. I know he's leading because of what he's making us understand. We're understanding the scriptures, and I, we have to praise God for that, that he's given us under, understanding the scriptures. I didn't get to that part in Matthew, in Matthew 24. 25, then shall the kingdom of, of heaven be likened unto what? Ten virgins. Ten virgins. They understand the scriptures. You need to recognize that you're, you're in the time that Christ prophesied of. 
You understand that prophecies, that's what the ten virgins is a symbol of. A people understand the signs of the times. And they take their lamps and they're going forth to meet the bridegroom, the specifications of the parable. Amen. That's what we began to do since 9-11. We're going now to meet Christ by the specification of the... I wish I had time to go through that part of Matthew 24. It's also a sign, a sign that the Bible is being opened up and being explained to us. And if we can't recognize that, then I don't know how we're going to recognize when the latter rain falls. If we can't see that Christ is explaining the scriptures to us and he's making us understand things that was dark to our understanding, there was a time when we didn't comprehend 1888 and all of these, and we can't recognize that, man, God is here teaching us, and you don't hear nothing like this when you turn on 3ABN and amazing facts and all of this stuff. You don't get any of these things. Your understanding don't get enlightened the way it is following, following what the Lord is. If we can't recognize that, then I don't know how we're even one of the foolish virgins. Because at least the foolish virgins recognized that prophecy yeah. was being fulfilled. Yeah. Even they recognized it. They just didn't what? Do what the Lord said to do. Amen. Yes. Amen. They need to connect this. Yes. Amen. Amen. And not connecting, because if you don't see the Sunday law, you won't leave the cities. Mm -hmm. So lad, these are the last two things. It says, get out of the large cities as fast as what? Get out of the what? Large. Get out of the large cities. When did she say this? Do y'all see the quote? Next, next, next. Why was she saying that? Because she's consistent with Matthew 24. When you see the sign, get out of the large cities, not the small ones, the large ones. Preparatory to what? leaving the small ones. Amen. But for us, because we understand, we can't even stand the small ones. Y'all follow? Yeah. We got to leave that too because the original command is what? Flee to the mountains. Yeah. Go there. But, it, but we lingered and we went to the small cities. It says, out of the cities, out of the cities, this is the message the Lord has been given me. Has been given. Praise God. And why can she say that? Because the sign has been seen. The earthquakes will come, the floods will come, and we are not to establish ourselves in the wicked cities where the enemy is served in every way and where God is so often forgotten. The Lord desires that we shall have clear spiritual eyesight. So we can't get clear spiritual eyesight in the large cities or any city? No, we can't. No, we can't. That's why she's saying that. Where do we get clear eyesight? In the country. There's nothing to obstruct our natural view. Amen. You see God in nature. No, no buildings, no planes, no helicopters, no sirens, no fire trucks, no billboards, no trucks, no trains blocking the natural view. But praise God, even in those things, because Christ was in Nazareth, they teach the gospel too. The Lord will take the life experiences to teach the gospel. And in them, one of the first things he's probably going to impress upon our minds, you need to leave this city because it's, it's not conducive to your health. It's not conducive. The Lord is going to use our help first and say, you need to leave because your health is not good to be in this large city. What's going on? The Lord desires that we shall have clear spiritual eyesight. We must be quick to discern the peril that would attend the establishment of institution in these wicked cities. We must make wise plans to warn the cities and at the same time live where we can shield our children and ourselves from the contaminating and dem demoralizing influences so prevailing in these places. Amen. Amen. And this is, once again, this portion where it says, are we prepared? Uh, <coughs> and that was the last quote um, for this. So bringing this so close, I just only went over this to show us that 1888 was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It was a sign to Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists worldwide, that wherever you are, when this becomes known, just like the cross, just like 1840, the message, once this becomes known, is get out of the large cities. That's the message. So wherever we are at Seventh-day Adventists, if you're hearing this, if the Lord by his mercy led you to watch his videos, we encourage you to leave the large cities, not, today, not, to, not tomorrow, not yesterday, right now. We need, to be, we need to be gone as far as, as soon as possible from that large cities. Immediately, quit your job. Apply for a job somewhere else. 
Seek a, 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 a place somewhere else, but do not remain in large cities. If we have a confusion on what is a large city, just go on Google and ask Google what's considered a large city. And if you're living there, the command is that Seventh-day Adventists, we need to get out now. The pestilence of COVID-19 should have impressed that upon our minds because most of the things done that was contrary to, to, to liberty was mostly in the large cities, were they not? So the next time it comes back, the large cities are going to really feel a stroke. They're going to really feel it when these dangers come back. And I pray that if we believe this, that we will make the effort. But we, on the other hand, while we may say um, not being one of those large cities, but unfortunately Huntsville is now considered a large city. So the command still is to us to do what? Yeah. To leave. To leave. And, and we have to plan. And every command we must, I love this promise, it's been hanging in my mind, every command is a what? promise. Every command is a promise. We just need to rally together and pray and ask the Lord to direct our steps so we can take the necessary, make the necessary movements as we can. So the conclusion is 1888 fulfilled of prophecy. It's a sign and connected with that sign is leave the large cities. This must be understood. And Christ has said all these things since 2020, 24, we've been seeing all these things and connected with all these things is the abomination. So we're about to see some things that will be assigned to us. And, and Ellen White, she has this quote saying, not only did Christ give them the warning sign, but he also told them how to escape. So while he's given us these signs, there's instructions on how to escape. But Matthew 24 tells us in Luke 13 and Mark, Mark 13 and Luke 21, he's not going to tell us unless we ask him. Y'all are following? The disciples asked him. So he's not going to tell us how to escape if we ask him. So we may see the sign all we want. Yeah, if we don't ask him. Thank you. We may see the sign all we want, and if we don't ask Christ, he won't tell us how to escape these judgments. So this is encouraging prayer, personal prayer. So I want to encourage us, you don't just get up and run. Seek God first, ask for direction, and then start making your plans to go. A man's heart divides it this way, and the Lord will direct thy steps. Amen? So let's close out with prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's a sure sign to us, O Lord, that your Holy Spirit is teaching us. For Father, I confess that these things were dark to my understanding. I never understood 1888 in this light, and, I'm, and I believe that is, that's the case for all of us. I've never seen it in this light before, Lord. All I ever heard about it was that it was righteousness by faith. That's all that was pushed about it. I heard about the Blair Bill, but I never seen it in this light. And Father, this is a sign to us, to me, that prophecy is being fulfilled and that you are indeed teaching us because you told us that whenever a new passage of Scripture bursts upon our understanding with new meaning, when an old passage of Scripture with new meaning, this is how we know that God is leading us because it's Satan's desire that we don't recognize a sign. He's always trying to hide the sign from God's people so that we won't recognize it and that we won't make the necessary movements that we ought to make whenever we do see it. So, Lord, as you brought this to our understanding, please help us to give the right response. I really pray and ask, O oh Lord, that you will help our unbelief because we believe, O oh Lord, we say we believe the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Please help our unbelief. Help us in that area where we, where, where we have doubt and confusion and are not taking the necessary steps. I really hate um, this, this spirit of disobedience that reigns in our heart, that reigns in my heart. And I pray and ask the Lord that you help us to crucify those foolish desires and that you would really help us to see that there is a God to fear and that there is a preparation that we need to make before you permit the enemy to bring the crisis, the very crisis he longs and is waiting to bring. But in mercy to us, you're overruling him and you're delaying that crisis. So please help us to see and understand this and make that necessary move. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.